So as we've just heard, morphometrics is the business of measuring shape. Um, Mm. And geometric morphometrics, um, I want to be making a distinction for us here today between two things that I see going on in geometric morphometrics. Um, Sorry, struggling with my notes. Um, Two things that I see going on in geometric morphometrics. So I think broadly speaking, we're doing two separate things with this set of techniques. I think big lump, we're using it to look at things like animal bones or human bones. Big lump, I think we're using it to look at artifacts. So these are two different areas in which we are working. So I'm going to present to you an argument today that what we're doing now, geometric morphometrics, the business of how things measure, totally important and appropriate for working with bones because bones are primarily functional. That and Their function is really what drives their shape and their form. But when we are looking at artifacts, we don't actually care so much how an artifact is shaped as the way that we as humans perceive it shaped. And I'm going to argue to you today that there's a subtle difference between perceived 3D shape and measured 3D shape, and that this difference is important in how we make groups. So I want to lay out for you a experimental method that I've been developing for how we create groups and what this might mean archaeologically specifically for artifacts using something that I'm referring to as perceptual morphometrics. Um, So how we perceptually organize features when we are making sense of shape. And so some of this is based on research by Schmidt and Fleming who have written a number of useful pieces. I have one citation up there on the visual perception of uh, complex shape transforming processes. Um, So basically there's a lot of research in cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology looking at how humans perceive shape and I encourage you all to go away and read about it. Um, So when does perceived shape matter? So I want to think about this for us as humans. How do you know that you have successfully mimicked an example of a product? If you are making a pot and you're trying to make it look like another pot and you're hand throwing, how do you know you've succeeded? You don't go around and take loads and loads of measurements of your pot, right? You, broadly speaking, look at the pot and you see whether or not two things look the same. As humans, our perception of shape has as much to do with the way we make groups as the way we measure shape. So there is, of course, also the shape itself and kind of a question of functional affordances. So if we think about hand axes or we think about a knife, right, the shape of a knife has certain functional affordances. The length of the knife will affect how well it cuts. So we have to deal with this kind of mix of measured shape, which has to do with functional affordances, which is why we use it for animal bones, and perceived shape, which I think has to do with what we think it's going to be useful for as humans um, and what it is we think it is. Um, In the sense that research in particularly cognitive psychology in recent years has shown us that the way we identify objects is not simply that we look at a shape and we then decide the category or what it could be used for, but our preconceptions of what the thing are, in fact, influence the shape that we think the thing has. So those two things are not, in fact, separate in your cognitive processes. They're kind of mixed up together. Um, so it means that we need to deal with these things together, and it also means that perceived shape is a specific and necessary geometric encoding for objects that are created and used by people which is pretty much a lot of the stuff that we archeologists are interested in. So how do we actually go about measuring perceived shape as opposed to shape shape, so the form of things? So if we think about our measured shape descriptors, we have things like contour measures, we have surface measures, we have landmarks and semi-landmarks, which we were just hearing about. We have global shapes, so fractal or texture measures, we have texture primitives. We have lots and lots of ways of measuring shape. So how do we actually measure perceived shape? So some of the important methods are listed up here. So the visual saliency of regions um, and then segmentation into parts on the basis of visual saliency is one set of perceived shape metrics. Just noticeable differences and measures of variability in just noticeable differences. So this is something that kind of comes out of computer graphics and how compression works, I think, is an interesting way of trying to maybe take measurements of perceived shape 
Um, and importantly, today, machine learning and computer vision approaches, there are now an enormous number of approaches to measuring perceived shape coming out of this domain, and that's specifically what I'm going to be looking at today. So, getting into a little bit of history of how we uh, measure perceived shape, this is a discipline with a long track record. So we have things like a graph-based visual saliency and Itty Koch, so these are kind of earlier models. We have differences between bottom-up versus top-down, task-independent versus task-dependent um, approaches. Uh, we have things like center surround mechanisms, scene versus fe feature saliency, so I'm not going into the detail on any of this today. This is to say to you that there is a lot of debate going on about how we actually measure perceived shape, so this is not a solved <laughs> thing. Um, so you basically pick one. Um, so what I think is interesting is even though there is not any fundamental agreement on how we perceive shape as humans and their competing ideas, this question of visual saliency, so what, what things we as humans look at, get baked into a lot of machine learning, computer vision algorithms. And you don't always know, unless you really dive into what they're doing, which assumptions they're baking in. So if you start to take a look, many machine learning computer vision methods bake in the center surround mechanism as something that drives attention. Um, that is that you probably start by looking at the middle of the image. Um, a lot of them assume something that's called inhibition of return, meaning if you look at something once, you get bored and you don't come back and look at it again. Um, many of them are multi-layer, so they use both low-level and high-level features. Um, some of them include global scene semantic information, so there are lots of different ways, again, that this is being done. But the takeaway for all of you is that this question of how we visually perceive shape is getting baked into machine learning computer vision methods. Um, so what this means, I think, in an interesting but complicated way, is that if we start trying to use machine learning computer vision methods to take measurements of how we as humans perceive shape and then create groups, we have to both pay attention to the fact that these things are baked in and maybe take advantage of it. So I have started to undertake a small experiment to look at how we might do this. So the way that I've moved forward is I've taken a really wonderful published data set that was assembled by Norman McLeod uh, for his article, Quantitative Assessment of Archaeological Artifact Groups Beyond Geometric Morphometrics, um, where he very generously stamp of approval published both his methods and all of his data. So I have basically nicked his entire data set to do my own experiment and do something else. Um, and so what McLeod did, for those of you who aren't familiar with this article, is he did three different analyses. So he did a traditional landmark-based geometric morphometric analysis of a whole bunch of uh, suited points uh, from North America to see whether or not they could be sorted out into sensible kind of regional groups. He then analyzed the same set of fluted points uh, using an image-based uh, geometric morphometrics um, approach um, using standard geometric morphometric procedures, and he then did a machine learning approach um, to the same image data set. Um, and his results showed that the landmark-based geometric morphometric results are sadly the worst. Um, that he gets better results with uh, image-based data, which is unsurprising to me because he can take many, many more measurements, so more data, more accuracy in this case, um, and that he got the best results from his naive Bayes machine learning classifier. Really, really excellent results creating regional groups. So why does the computer vision machine learning image-based method work best? Is it more sophisticated measurements of metric shape or is something else going on? And in case you can't tell by my foreshadowing of the way that human visual attention gets based into these machine, baked into these machine learning uh, computer vision approaches, I think there's something else going on. And I think part of the reason why he got the best results from that third run is not just that he has more data because he's using Im an image-based approach, but because he, his results are whether or not he knew it taking advantage of the way that humans perceive shape um, and how that's getting baked into those algorithms. So perceived shape is intruding here. So if we think about how images work, images capture a mix of perceived and measured shape. And when we recognize similarity or we're defining characteristics 
categories in the real world, as I was saying before. The parts that we look at most, this is kind of the version of things I buy into, so the parts with the greatest visual saliency, I think contribute the most to our definition of groups. And so we are working on the basis, therefore, of perceived shape as humans when we create groups of artifacts. Because the bits of the pointed flutes that we look at the most, that we pay the most attention to, are the bits that we end up using to define different groups. If you don't spend a lot of time looking at the tippy point of your artifact, it doesn't end up implicitly in your definition of these different groups. Um, and so many machine learning algorithms perfect preferentially use information from visually salient regions to define groups, much like humans do, um, and image-based ones rely on perceived shape. So this is basically what I think is happening. So, uh, getting on to my own experiment here, calculating the visual saliency of McLeod's fluid points. So what I did is I took all of his image data, I tested a bunch of different uh, saliency metrics against them. I uh, settled on the SmoothGrad TensorFlow implementation because it's designed to reduce noise. So in these charts, for those of you who are not familiar with saliency maps, areas that are mapped in white are high saliency, which means according to models of how human visual attention works, those are the bits that you are most likely to look at most of the time, on average, as a human or a macaque. Um, so yeah, they're in the models. So basically, what I think is really interesting here that we can start to see is that we don't look so often at the bits of the fluted points that we would use to traditionally do geometric morphometric measurements, <coughs> right? Because most of these measurements have to do with the edges and the tips and the bases, and that's not really where, as humans, we tend to look. Um, and if you're interested in checking my results or going and doing something similar, um, the data is obviously open published and I've got the links to the code bases I used up there, so it's all available. Um, so what we can start to see here is that um, if you look across all of the different fluted points that he used in his study, in fact only about 11%, 19 out of 179 that he looked at, have a lot of saliency concentrated at their point. Um, only about 20% have lots of high saliency regions concentrated around their edges. So I think, in fact, this kind of highlights a real issue in using geometric morphometrics for objects if you buy my, the bits we look at are important for making groups argument because the bits that we measure all the time are not, in fact, the high saliency regions. So there's a really interesting tension here. Um, so if we start to look at the importance of central regions, um, because really the high saliency regions concentrate in the interior of the fluted points in 90% of what I looked at, um, what we're actually attracted to looking at as humans is the ridges, the flake scars, the percussion bulbs, all of which tantalizingly for me have to do with the process and the practice of making the thing. Um, so I think there are some very interesting things going on there. Um, we can have a debate later about whether or not I have a center surround mechanism problem. Um, so how can we now head towards making groups? We can do something called measuring co-saliency. So co-saliency detection refers to the discovery of common and salient foregrounds from two or more relevant images. So there are no kind of semantic categories baked into this. So I ran a number of co-saliency uh, tests uh, within the existing regional groups and then within mixed groups, so kind of random subsets. Um, so you can kind of see high cosaliency regions highlighted here. So again, white is higher cosaliency. Um, so this is really about defining groups on the basis of recognized perceived similarity. Um, and so this is just preliminary at the moment because I've been doing it in about the past two weeks. Um, so what we can start to see Coming out here, I think, if you look at these histograms and the difference between the NCE region, which is one of the coherent regional groups versus mixed regions, is that in the MCE region, it is representing a real thing and that we have more examples with higher degree of co-saliency, so more things that are perceived the same within that regional group. And it also means, I think, we can develop a method where we try to essentially maximize co-saliency to define coherent groups. Um, on the basis of their perceptual characteristics. So I am, in short, proposing a perceptual morphometrics approach to creating meaningful groups of artifacts that relies on calculations of perceived shape over measured shape 
when working with groups defined by people out in the real world. And I think we can do this by maximizing co-saliency to create meaningful groups that reflect how people are actually visually engaging with object similarity. Thank you very much.